Ephesians 6, 1 Thessalonians 5. Charge. Hadn't heard that in a long time, have you? Huh? Salute. Attention. Charge. Some TV preachers, when they say charge, that means there's a credit card machine in the pew. Not making this up. This uh, quack preacher, in fact, his last name is Crank. If I get in the ministry I'm, and my name is Crank, I'd rather have Hoggard than Crank. But anyway, um, who was it told me that they were working at his church and they had credit card machines in the lobby where you could stick your card in and give them all the money. That's about as bad as having one at a casino. They have a, have a, they actually can make loans, machines, banking machines that give loans, cash loans at a casino. That is a bad idea. Unless you're the bank or the casino. Bad idea. They ought to outlaw that, but I'm not the one that makes the laws. Ephesians 6, what did I tell you? 1 Thessalonians what? Just make sure you're paying attention. Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So we're learning about devils and evil angels and little g gods that operate in the spiritual realm against us. We are the army that stands against them. Though there not be many of us, it doesn't take many. Gideon showed us that. So, put on the whole armor of God that you may be, able, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's what I have up on the screen. And against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Does it make sense if we build a fence from California all the way to Brownsville, Texas, but leave an area open. If you're going to build a fence, a wall, you have to build it from one end to the other. Because if you're the enemy and you're wanting to come in, you're going to come in where there's no wall. Amen? So it just stands to reason. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to have a part of a wall put up. Uh, because they have already shown that they don't mind marching for hundreds and hundreds of miles to try to come in illegally. And the devils won't either. They, they don't pay attention to what you want, what you don't want. So you have to take the whole armor of God. Uh, verse 14, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, all of those are for your defense. They are for your protection. The one thing that you hold that gives you an offensive position is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So all of these things are meant to defend and protect us, including the sword. You bear the sword so that you'll never have to use it. Amen? If I'm carrying openly a, a robber, a thief, is not necessarily, I'm not saying they won't, but I would not be their first primary target because I'm carrying openly. If I have it 
if you watch police officers on television, real police officers, when they approach a vehicle, their hand is automatically on their sidearm. Why? To have it ready. Quick draw. Because more than one officer has approached a vehicle. This, I'm in favor of body cams because they look cool. But they're the evidence. Officer approaches a vehicle. A guy opens the vehicle and immediately pulls his weapon and begins shooting at the officer. That officer did not know that was going to If he knew that was going to happen, obviously he would not approach the vehicle. He would have done what's called a felony stop. He would have aimed his weapon and said, put your hands out, get out of the car, let me see your hands. But in this case, he approached the vehicle, his hand on his sidearm, the body can shows the car door opening, and the guy in the car immediately pulls out his gun and starts firing on the officer. Be ready at all times. Amen? So, your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, gospel of peace, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Uh, here lately I've been watching videos of police officers arresting police officers who are drunk. Some of them drunk while on duty they should be arrested and never allowed to be a police officer anywhere father in heaven you asked us to pray you called upon us to pray it does not bother you when your children pray because you're there for us waiting for us to call upon you and father you're a very good father to your children of course you're going to protect your children, but you're also going to train your children on how to use the armor of God, how to use that shield, how to use the sword, how that we bear not the sword ever in vain. And Father, teach us, Lord, how to stand and defend our families, our faith, our church, Lord, help us to do so, loving one another, loving the brethren, loving even the enemies that attack us, loving them and being able to tell them the truth and doing so in love. Father, help us to do that. Help us to be faithful about it. Help us to be diligent in our watch over the things that you've given us. We love you and we ask for your grace and your mercy. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said... Amen. Um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you look there, Paul says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in what time? Night. So, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. I touched on that Wednesday night. Spoke on it. Taught on it. Preached on it. Being sober. Teaching our children, likewise, to be sober. Teaching them by us being the example to them. Amen? If we're a good example, we will set a good example for the children. If we're a bad example, then our children will rise up and mock us. Because that's what's happening right now. You have an entire generation of young people that grew up in church watching their parents be hypocrites. And they, of course, say, we're not going to just about any church. We're not going to church at all because in our eyes, it was all fake. They saw their pastor being an adulterer, being a drunkard, being a dope addict, 
They saw their pastor not living the faith that he spoke of. And so to them, it was a joke. So they are children of darkness. Verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. So when they are in the night, there are things that rule over them and they cannot escape that. Is there ever a night when the people of earth say to the moon and the stars, take a vacation and leave us alone. Do not shine your light upon us. Does that, yeah, they might say that. They may howl at the moon. But the moon doesn't go away simply because the people want it to go away. And the stars do not disappear simply because the people don't want the stars there. And those stars, Psalm 136 verse 9, the moon and the stars rule by night for his mercy endureth forever so the bible's teaching you that that moon and those stars even if you want to see this as merely symbolic there is substance to the symbolism in other words even if you think that that is just a symbolic idea that concept that god is putting in our mind there is still a substance to the symbolism there are spirits that rule over people who walk in darkness. Can I get an amen out of God's people? So, take a look up on the screen. There's the rulers of the darkness of this world. God appointed the moon, and God appointed the stars to be what rules over people who walk in darkness. Now, here's what I'm telling you. If you are born again, if you are saved by God's grace, then you walk in the light, uh, turn to 1 John. I feel like I've got to read a verse here so that you believe me. How can I teach you if I just give you my words? 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, meaning Christ, we have fellowship one with another, meaning that if I'm born of God and you're born of God, what does that make us? Brothers, bros. Hey, bro. Hey, sis. That means we're all children of God. We're children of day. That means we are brethren. We're related to one another. Which means that we're not related to children who are in darkness. Their father and our father are not the same father. Amen? And there's always evidence. It's always manifested whether or not people walk in darkness. If your house is full of booze and drugs, you walk in darkness. And those things rule over your life. Can I get amen? Can I get amen from God's people online? Okay, I'll get that. So if, if, that's, if that's the life that you have decided to live, then your father and my father are, is not the same father, and we're not brethren. We're not brothers and sisters. We're not of the same family. You get what I'm saying to you? They are a different race, a different breed, and I'm talking of a spiritual race. And to me, the spiritual realm is more real than what we live in right now. We're just a shadow of the spiritual realm. And so, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. It's like we had a blood transfusion from a... Who is it that's the universal donor? O negative? O neg? So... You saying positive? Oh, negative. So it's like we got a blood transfusion, and now all of our DNA is different. Now we are children of God. He rules over us. He's the boss. He's the Lord. He tells us what to do, and guess what? That's what we do. We do it. But there are people who are children of darkness they are ruled over by the rulers of the darkness of this world. And 1 Thessalonians 5 is telling you that they sleep. They're drunk. Probably spiritually 
and physically. And when they're drunk spiritually, they can read the Bible or have the Bible read to them and it makes no sense to them. You remember back in the 60s and 70s, probably, probably even now, there was a lot of experimentation with LSD and just people taking trips like that. While they were taking these trips, they would write songs. When you're high, the lyrics make perfect sense. But when you come down, you look at it and you're going, I have no idea what that is. But it makes sense to somebody that's on drugs. So it's obvious that the spirit that controls them, we do not comprehend that darkness. And their darkness does not comprehend our light. That's what John was saying in John chapter 1. The light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. They do not understand our ways, our life, our beliefs, what we do, why we do it. They don't understand the word of God. You can give it to them all day long and it will make no sense because they're ruled over by a different spirit. So take a look at that up on the screen. And then I'm going to show you what I'm, what I'm speaking of. There are nations all over the world that actually display who rules over their people. It's in their flag. The crescent moon and star, from what I can see, is manifest what spirit rules over them. And in these nations, Algeria, Azerbaijan, Pakistan, Tunisia, Turkey, Malaysia, Generally, they are not known as being Christian nations. What are they? Primarily Muslim. Primarily, the people of those nations are Muslim. They practice the religion of Islam. And by the symbolism there, that tells me that they are ruled over by the rulers who rule over the night, the moon and the stars, the evil angels, the gods, the de devils rule over them. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'll give you eight seconds. That's how long you're supposed to ride a bull. When you're riding bulls. They give you eight seconds. If you can last eight seconds, Courtney, you get a score. Okay? Huh? And a lot of sores. That's exactly right. If you wonder why some of these guys walk funny, there's a reason. Okay? You have an atomic bomb underneath your backside go off on you. If you can last eight seconds, you're a different man. I tell you that. When I heard that, you remember Brother Ron Dagonia, when I first went to work for him, I found out that not only was he in rodeo, but he rode bulls. And then when they gouged him too much and he decided not to ride him anymore, he fought him as a rodeo clown. And I had it in my mind that a man that was not afraid of a bull was definitely not afraid of another man. So I never tried to get into it with him. That's wise of me. Amen. He wasn't afraid of me. He never was going to be. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 14. Look at what God said. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whether you go over to possess it. God's conditions for the land that he promised them was very specific. It was in no way ambiguous. It was written down just like if you rent from somebody, you have a lease agreement, do you not? And it's written down and stipulated what the landlord can do and what you can do. What you cannot do. You cannot build a pool in your backyard. Amen? I wouldn't. Because if you spend $20,000 on a swimming pool and you move out, you lost the swimming pool. Okay, But it stipulates what you can and cannot do. And God gave them rules and he wrote it down for them. And it was very explicit what they could and could not do. So verse 15, he said, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb. He's talking about Mount Sinai, out of the midst of the fire. In other words, you saw the mountain, 
you saw the fire on top of the mountain, but you did not see me. You did not see my image. You did not see my face. You heard my voice, and that was it. I was covered by that cloud, and you did not see me. So he said, verse 16, he's reminding me of that because he says, lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image. The similitude, that's the second time he uses that word in this passage. The similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. God is not a woman. Amen? Now, every place in the Bible tells you that God is masculine. But yet, they saw no image of God. Therefore, God said, you don't know what I look like. The likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And then he said, Unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun, and the moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them. Now, did God know what he was talking about? Sure he did. God knew the moon. God knew the stars. God knew what they represented. God had a name for every one of those stars. God, all through the Bible, the symbolism is that the stars are angels. Now, again, if you say, well, I think that's just mere symbolism. They're not really angels, but I can see you know, okay, whatever. I tend to believe that what we see in the sky is a representation of what they are. Now, what is the sun made of? Does anybody know? Anybody take a guess? What the, we know it's hot, right? We know that it's burning and it provides light and what? Heat. What are angels made of? What is their substance? What does the Bible say that they are born of or made of light and fire fire they are fiery angels so i see the connection here and god said lest you should be driven to worship them and then he said serve them so he's defining what worship is worshiping is serving them so you go to the bookstore you buy this book on astrology you learn that you're a Capricorn, or you might be a, a, what is that, a Sagittarius. You might be a Gemini. Who's our Geminis? Anybody but me? I'm a Gemini. Who? What month were you born? Oh, yeah. We're Geminis. Okay? Now, astrology says that wherever those stars happen to be positioned, on any given day determines how your day is going to go. Those stars rule over your life. Now, you can say, oh, that's a bunch of hogwash. In other words, that's a bunch of nonsense. That doesn't mean anything. And yet, it is very evident to me that very evil spirits rule over a lot of people. Can you believe that one? They absolutely do. And God said, in worshiping them, you serve them. In other words, when they tell you to do something, you do it. Or you're going to do it. So someone lays out your, your astrological sign and tells you, okay, that on this such and such a date, Gemini is going to be in the house of... Orion, or he's going to be in the moon, or he's going to be here, and that means then that this is going to happen to you, and you should probably, and they even tell you who to marry and who not to marry. Oh, Geminis, they're really good with Virgos, but Geminis and Cancer, they don't go well together. That is they ruling over you. And you serving them. 
And anybody, I'll, I'll say it like this, anybody who has turned their back on God has turned toward cruel authority. Amen? Who has a flashlight? Anybody here have a flashlight in their purse? You got a flashlight? Phone? Come up here, Alicia. I'm going to show you something real simple. Oh, now all of you are shining your lights on me. What is it? What are you, a concert? Hey, kumbaya, my Lord. Okay. Alicia is going to be, I'm going to be the sun. I'm going to be the sun, okay? You're going to be, this is the earth. Okay? Right. So, I, it's round, because look at her head. Okay? So here's the sun, and facing the sun is all of the people Face the sun now. I'll pull it back a little bit. Don't stare directly in the sun, just face it. All the people that read the Bible, that believe the Bible, they say God's word is true, and they love the Lord, and they serve the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Malachi called him the son of righteousness. Isaiah called him the sun and the shield over all the people of the earth. So Jesus is the light of the world, and he's the sun, and you face the sun, your child of the day, that means that sun does not bother you. And wherever that sun leads you, you're going to follow it, no matter what. Amen? Unless you turn your back. Now there's somebody else going to follow the sun, the light, but you've you okay? Okay. But you've got your face against God. Look that up in your Bible. You'll find verses where they turned their back to God and turned away from His light, His word, and His righteousness. Somebody else is going to serve God. Amen? But what now what God has done, because you've Turn your back to God. God has now placed over you cruel authority. Instead of having one light, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands. And what does the Bible say about those who will, I can't remember the exact verse, but it goes something like, if people will not obey God, he'll give them many princes in authority over them. That sound kind of familiar like what you read? Okay, thank you very much. You can turn your back to God now. Let's go now. Yeah. And they'll accuse me of woman preachers. Okay? But you get the illustration. When you've turned your back to God, automatically God has placed you under cruel authority because those devils are mean, they're evil. They are beasts. They're very intelligent, but they are beasts nonetheless, and they do not stray away from what is in their nature. Does that make sense? So, God knew what he was talking about, and he said, when you go into this land, here's the rules. The, his law, the Bible says, is light. The entrance of thy words giveth light. God shined the light so brightly when Moses come down with the law in his hands, what's his face doing? Shining like the sun. And what did Israel do? Cover it up. Cover it up. We can't, we don't want that light shining on us. So whenever Moses came out to speak, they made him put a veil over his face. And Paul said, used that illustration and said to this day, when they read the Old Testament, they don't understand what it means. They do not see what's behind the veil. They cannot understand it. Because God has placed them under cruel authority. Look in your Bible at uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Eight seconds. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past... Under the fathers by who? 
How many? Not just one. Not one singular prophet. Prophets, plural. Like the number of stars at night. Shining him. But starlight and moonlight are terrible lights to try to navigate by and try to walk by. Maybe an exception, a really bright full moon one night. My brother-in-law, Gene, used to scare me to death. I made the mistake of getting in the car with him one time before he and Melissa got married. And he went speeding down these back roads, hematite, Missouri, and then he would turn the headlights off at night. Yeah. Scared me to death. And he did it on purpose. He's standing there laughing. And I went home and told my mom about it. Huh? Yeah. But you see my point. When you turn your back on the sun, the Bible, the Word of God, you are automatically, it's not that you chose this authority, that's what you're going to get. These stars, these evil gods, these devils, they're going to rule over you, and we're the ones fighting them. So how do we fight stars? Your light shines brighter than theirs. You know somebody that is being influenced by evil angels. You see a worldly influence in their life. And you know that they're walking in darkness. The greatest thing that you can ever do for them is to shine the light of Jesus through you. Because not only did Jesus say, I'm the light of the world, he looked at his disciples and he said, ye are the light of the world. Ye are. The church is. We are. And when we shine the light of Jesus Christ, I know this sounds kind of like silly stuff, but it's real. When we shine the light of the Word of God to people who walk in darkness, that's how we fight and do warfare against stars, against these angels. So we shine a light that is brighter than theirs. Do the stars go away when the daylight comes out, when the sun comes up? No, they're still there. Can't see them. You can't see any of them. Because the light of the sun far exceeds their light. Somebody say amen. I like this. So he said in Hebrews 1, 1, Spake in time passed unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Singular. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Who being, look at the verse 3, look at verse 3. Who being what? The brightness of his glory, the Bible says. Jesus is the light, the sun that rules over the day. He rules over his people. We walk in the light of Jesus Christ and his word. They walk in darkness and are only led by these evil angels. Turn to Deuteronomy 17. I'm only going to give you six seconds for that one. Deuteronomy 17. Five, four, three. Verse two. If there be found among you within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods, and worship them. See how the Bible puts it together again? Worship means serving them. And when you serve them, you also worship them. I mean, imagine if you were like the king or the queen of America. And the people who come into you, they must give you honor and respect as the king or queen. They'll bow to you and give respect. And if you say, this is what I want you to do, then that's what you have to do. So think of these evil angels the exact same way so in transgressing his covenant verse 3 and hath gone and served other gods and worshiped them either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven which i have not commanded and it be told thee and thou hast heard of it and inquired diligently and behold it be true and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in israel 
Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. That's cruel authority. Now, whenever I see the, the judgment of being stoned with stone, that's execution. You're going to kill somebody for breaking the law. And in this case, they got into astrology or divination by means of the motions of the planets and the stars and the moon. They worshipped and they served these gods. And if, Now, if God thought this was all just superstition and it wasn't true, I mean, big deal. But see, God made them. And God knows who they are. And he said... Don't follow them. Don't worship them. Can I talk about you for a minute? Publicly, in front of everybody? When you got saved and started coming here to church, you brought me a box. What did it have in it? It had the light of stars in it. How many different occult books were there? Different topics is what I mean. 15 different occult topics. All of them containing their version of a truth. And this occult idea and technique was different than this, what this book said in it. Am I right? See, they were all contradictory to one another. But he had believed that he would ultimately find a truth in all of this. He never found it. Never found it. So he gave them the means to do what you want with them, but I was going to burn them. That's what they did in the book of Acts. Okay? All of these different gods, they're not all playing on the same team. Oh yeah, they're against God, but they all have different ways and different doctrines and different rituals and different ideas, and it does nothing but bring confusion. It's like walking in the woods at night trying to see by the light of the stars. You never get there. But anyway, when I see people being stoned with stones, you know what I think? I think it's a foreshadowing. Daniel chapter 2. The fourth kingdom and all of the kingdoms that were standing in that fourth kingdom were destroyed by what means? A stone. That stone, that rock was Jesus Christ. And when somebody is stoned with stones as a judgment for them breaking God's covenant, that to me foreshadows God's judgment upon the world for mingling themselves with these entities in that fourth kingdom. And those entities, in, from what I can see, are devils. They have mingled and joined with devils. I've never even asked you this question. But did you ever experience a spiritual force that scared you? Okay, you don't have to tell it. But when those devils reveal their true nature, they're not good. I've read testimonies of people who got into astrology, got into New Age practices, got in contact with what the Bible calls familiar spirits, they called them um, spirit guides. A lot of times they were animals, spirit animals that they were in contact with. And the first contact that they made with these spirits, they felt a euphoria that was better than any, better than Percocet, better than morphine, better than cocaine, better than marijuana. It was a rush and an experience and a high that no drug on earth could even touch. And they felt what they called pure love. And then they wanted more of it. And they got more in contact with these devils. These spirit guides. And after a while, these guides then, if the person missed getting in contact with them on a certain day... These spirits were not nice about it. Where were you? 
Why weren't you here? And it brought fear in them. And I, man, I'm telling you what, this is the, what they ha- said what happened was these spirits started demanding their obedience and terrorizing them. And as they made further contact with them, the light that used to shine from them became darkness and they started seeing what these things really were and it scared them to death. But they had no power against these devils who were demanding their worship. I'm telling you, devils don't play right. Amen? And God said, I'm going to give you a strict sentence. If you mess with them, I'm going to stone you with stones. One more, pl- I got to show you this. Turn to Isaiah chapter 3. I got to show you this. Then we'll let you go. Uh, I tweeted something last night. I, I got a real blessing. Uh, a man, and I believe I've talked to this man. I think he called here about a month ago, and we had a great conversation. But he, a video popped up on YouTube as a recommendation, and it was an interview with someone who used to believe the flat earth. And um, so anyway, I thought, well, that'd be interesting if I'm going to listen to this. And if it's, you know, clean, doesn't have a lot of curse words in it, something like that, then I'll put it on the website, geofrisbee.com. So I'm watching it. And there was a British man interviewing an American man about how he came out from the flat earth movement. He used to believe the earth was flat. And then he saw it for what it was and decided to come out and he doesn't believe it anymore. Well, about halfway through that video, he mentioned my name. And he said, you know, this guy in his videos, I've been watching his videos for a while, but then he started making flat earth videos. And he said he really, he made sense. He gave scriptures and said that you cannot reason with a lot of these people because their belief is not in their brain, it's in their heart. And that's what God showed me one day about why people turn to strange doctrines. Why do people, how do people get deceived? They get deceived in their heart. And so... It, this is funny to me because I made a video about why I thought the flat earth idea was not right biblically. And in one of the comments, most of these comments are not nice. This guy said, Hoggard needs to read the Bible because the Bible plainly says that the moon is round like a tire. I'm not making that up. Like a tire. Look at, look at Isaiah chapter 3. Verse 18. In fact, take a look on the screen. A baby moon hubcap on a round tire, right? Let's look at what the Bible actually says. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet. They were wearing ornaments on their feet. Tinkling ornaments. When you, wear, when you wear something like that, you want people to look at you when you walk into a room, right? You want attention. And their calls and their round tires like the moon. What does that phrase actually, in 21st century English, what would that really say to us? A tire. A-T-T-I-R-E. They were wearing ornaments around their feet and they were wearing round attire shaped like the moon. Like, you've seen a wizard's hat, right? A little pointed hat and it was, what does it have on it? A moon and stars. That's where they get their power from. These, they were wearing some sort of attire that was shaped like the moon. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers and the... You've worn mufflers, haven't you? Wrapped around your, your neck. Bonnets, you wear bonnets. Ornaments of the legs and headbands and the tablets and the earrings. In other words, they were adorning themselves with the attire of the heavens. They were wearing the attire of their gods on them. The rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins. And the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. I don't know what a wimple and a crisping pin is. But the Bible didn't say the moon was round like a tire. 
like that. And I just, I did, I chuckled. I went, you know what, I'm not even going to, I was going to comment, I'm going, uh, you need to go back and read it again. They're describing a car. They're dressed like a car. The British call the hood a bonnet, and they call the trunk a boot. Where's the engine? In the bonnet? Jeremiah 8, 2, I'll leave you alone, and they shall spread bef them before them, the sun and the moon, and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served. Now listen to this. Who you love is who you serve. Amen to that? Who you love is who you'll serve. If you love Jesus, you'll serve him. You won't mind. You won't need to be paid. You won't need blessings. You just serve him. There was in the law that if you were a bond slave, and once you paid off your debt, or in the year of... of Proclaiming liberty in the Jubilee year, you were set free from the debt if you wanted to go back and voluntarily serve that man, you could. And they would put a ring on your ear, and that meant that you were a free servant. You were not there to pay off a debt. You were serving that man for the rest of your life, you and your family, out of love. Because you, that man treated you well. He loaned you money. He let you pay off the debt. And you, and you said, you know what? I'm really not good as a farmer. So I'm going to serve this man because he's treated me well. And I'm going to serve him the rest of my life. And that's who we are, people. We can, God set us free. And we came back and said, we want to serve you the rest of our life. Because we've never had a master to us that was as good as you are. Amen? And who you love is who you serve. And who you serve is who you love. Amen? Father in heaven, open our eyes. There are spirits all around us. They hate us. They hate what we believe. They hate whose sons we are. They hate the light that outshines them. Even Lucifer himself, the light bearer, is jealous and hates you, God. And at one time, we served him. And at one time, we loved our sin. And now, we hate it. And we don't want to serve it anymore. And we've been set free by the master, Jesus. And we've come back as free people. Serving not out of bondage, but out of choice. Thank you, God, for accepting us back in. And let us be, letting us be your servant. And Lord, we'll follow you and serve you the rest of our lives here. And then we'll follow you and serve you for all of eternity. Because you're worth it. Father, I thank you for this book. This, I, Lord, I'm nothing. I am nothing without this book. And I thank you, God, for what this book has meant to me all my life, what it is to me, and what it's made me into. God, I, I feel like I owe you, but I know I don't. But I'm willing to serve you the rest of my life for what you've done for me. Thank you, God, for helping us see the light. Thank you, God, for removing us out of the kingdom of darkness into your light. And help us, Father, everywhere to fight darkness, to fight the rulers of the darkness of this world and how they blind people's eyes. Help us, dear God, to open those eyes. Give them a choice. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord. Dismiss us now and send us home in your care. Help us, dear God, throughout this week. We pray in Jesus' name and all the God's people said. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to pray for Sister Linda, Sister Pam, uh, Sister Elaine, the lady that called, said she broke her arm. Don't, don't forget to pray for them.
and to uh, call upon the Lord for them, all right?